All right, we are going to go ahead and get started with our webinar series. Good evening and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webinar series, Natural Resource Policy, Culture and Law. Before we start, we would like to recognize that as a land grant institution, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as their traditional caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. This is the fourth and final panel in our symposium economic commercialization of traditional resources and land. For our attendees, you are invited to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to ask your questions. If you're on Facebook, you can leave your questions in a comment. We will have some time to address your questions at the end of the webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our four panelists and our moderator. First up will be Curtis Jai Chi Pei from the Institute of Wildlife Conservation, National Bingtung University of Science and Technology. He will be joining us today as he was unable to present two weeks ago in panel two due to a power outage. And his presentation will be toward the self-governance of indigenous hunting in Taiwan. Second, we will have Benjamin Murray, Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations, Australia with the presentation, Legal Form and the Commercial Use of Aboriginal Lands in Australia. Third, we will have Sabiha Yusman Rosie from the University of Dhaka exploring the commercialization of resources in the Chittagong Hills Tract, CHT of Bangladesh, an economy of uneven tourism development. And last, we will have Emma Garlett from the University of Western Australia, the right approach to water management, the need for a traditional owner merits appeal against water licensing decisions in Western Australia. And our moderator today is Associate Professor Guy Charlton from the University of New England. And now I'll pass the floor over to Guy. Thanks, Maddie. Um, I'm really excited about today's presentations. This area of commercialization and the looking at indigenous resources in a more commercial manner is an important and growing area of, uh, of natural resource use. We're going to start with uh, uh, Professor Curtis. Curtis, as Maddie mentioned, was uh, subject to a power outage a couple weeks ago and was unable to present then. Uh, Curtis will be talking about uh, uh, the self-governance of indigenous hunting in Taiwan, and then uh, uh, Ben will be speaking after Curtis. So I give the floor to, floor to you, Curtis. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, to the uh, organizers that allowed me to uh, present my uh, talks today, uh, two weeks after the original uh, schedule. Uh, but uh, thanks for uh, all of you, and I will start my presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm going to. Um, share with you that on the present uh, ongoing development of the uh, indigenous hunting um, management in Taiwan. And, uh, oops. Okay. Okay, this is Taiwan. And um, so uh, we have big mountains and um, this is a central mountain range. Uh, most of the, uh, many uh, mountain peaks above 3,000 meters, and the highest would, uh, is 4,000 meters above the sea level. And uh, this is the smaller uh, mountain range, uh, uh, coastal mountain range. The highest peak is only uh, 1,500 uh, meters above the sea level. And majority of the mountains uh, are used by the indigenous people uh, for uh, for many thousand years, or uh, uh, so. Uh, so we do have uh, quite a um, quite a 
lot uh, indigenous uh, tribes and uh, communities that uh, in the mountain areas now today. And uh, so uh, there are the, the, the distribution of the uh, different communities is quite uh, compact that throughout the whole mountain areas and uh, uh, the communities that uh, the territories is ma managed by the communities. And uh, this is the concept of the, how the community is distributed in the mountain areas. And the, uh, each communities, they have, their, uh, they have their hunting ground within their territories. Okay, uh, this is a brief uh, background of the hunting uh, management in Taiwan that the present Han Chinese government came to Taiwan in 1949 and uh, uh, implement a hunting act uh, uh, start uh, uh, at that time. And the hunting act was suspended in 1973 mainly because the firearm control uh, necessary. Uh, so uh, there's no hunting uh, allowed uh, after 1973. So, uh, so the hunting was total banned uh, since 1973. And 1989, the hunting act was replaced by the Wildlife Conservation Act. And so, uh, and the, we think the uh, in the Wildlife Conservation Act, uh, the in indigenous people allowed to hunt for ceremonial uh, purpose, uh, and and so, but they need to uh, submit the applications for for the specific ceremony uh, 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 ceremonies, and and this was under the uh, Wildlife Conservation Act Article Twenty One and. Um, uh, so, uh, so since 1989, uh, that uh, indigenous people in Taiwan uh, can can practice hunting uh, only. Only indigenous people can practice hunting, and Han Chinese uh, still under the hunting ban. And 2004, the Article 21 of the Wildlife Conservation Act was uh, amended and to, uh, to further extend uh, the areas that, that the indigenous people can hunt. So which uh, is, uh, is uh, so the is expansion of the, uh, of the hunting, uh, hunting rights. Okay, and in 2016, uh, uh, the President Tsai Ing-wen uh, officially apologized to Taiwan's indigenous people and uh, uh, represent the government to apologize. And uh, since 2016, the, there are more uh, requests from, uh, from the indigenous uh, tribal members for more uh, for hunting uh, uh, Right. And so uh, in early 2017, the wildlife management authorities, the, the Forest Bureau, uh, start to, uh, start to uh, have a project that um, to experimentally that see that whether or not the indigenous hunting can be more uh, self-government. Uh, self -govern uh, government. So uh, this this has been uh, experimentally that um, practice in the several tribal areas, tribes, uh, communities that as I show in the map, that there are uh, more than 10 uh, communities now is under the Forest Bureau experimental project that they can they can have more uh, more free, uh, more free, uh, free hunting uh, compared with other indigenous communities. So I'm giving you uh, one example. This is in uh, Zhou 
uh, ethnic groups that they are in the southern Taiwan and uh, uh, presently there are two big communities of uh, Zhou uh, groups and each has uh, leaders and the pictures show the leader uh, within the Kuba, that's the, their uh, community centers uh, with the traditional uh, clothes that this is the leader of, of the uh, Tefuye uh, communities. And uh, they live in the Ali San areas. I will show you later that where they are. And uh, the, the, they have practiced hunting for uh, several thousand years in that areas and in their own territories. And uh, in 2018, that as a response to the government new policies that the Zhou hunters form an associations. And, and this is the first uh, hunters associations that in Taiwan that uh, include the whole uh, ethnic groups. And so uh, after that, uh, until today, uh, 90 or, or close to 100% tribal members who hunt, they are the member of these associations. So which means that this association actually includes uh, uh, almost 100% of the hunters of Zhou uh, people. Uh, so two, uh, three, uh, 350 members that, uh, now, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, this association has 350 members and uh, over 200 members already obtained hunter's license. With this hunter's license, as I show you, that uh, they, can, they, can have, uh, they can have more uh, hunting rights compared with others. And uh, this is uh, the, 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 also the association that issued the license to their members and, and the license uh, is valid only for two years. And so they need to renew their license. And, and for renewed license, they need, to, uh, they, they, they need to follow the regulations and also need to uh, attend 36 hours training courses. This is according to this particular uh, association. Now, uh, and the regulations of the uh, Zhou hunting activities that has to be followed by the members that according to the uh, uh, rules. And in chapter four, specifically that uh, talking about hunting Ainu. Ainu is a kind of restrictions or uh, more specifically uh, is the traditional terms for, uh, for hunt, hunting regulations or, or restrictions. So uh, members or who has the hunter's license need to follow uh, this regulation specifically chapter four. So, uh, so they have to report their harvest to the association all the time. And this is, uh, of course, not a traditional uh, hunting requirements to the hunter uh, to the Zhou hunters, but this is a new requirements that as the member of the association, the member need to report their harvest, and they cannot uh, pur uh, purposely shoot or trap endangered species. Uh, in in their areas, uh, black bear is the uh, is the most likely. Uh, uh, non-target species that which is endangered species uh, which is endangered to Taiwan. Now, uh, so they uh, they use uh, the the modern technologies. This is a smartphone um, and uh, to to report their harvest. And this has been going on for uh, four years so far, and uh, it is getting more and more. Uh, uh, they practice more and more and uh, get better and better. And they also uh, report non-game species uh, they run into in the mountains, like this is the pangolins, and they will take uh, pictures of the pangolins and they report the locations and release the pangolins. They, they also, from time to time, to report, uh, to submit a report like this, it is just a, a video uh, of uh, Simba deer. So, and other than wildlife, 
they also report the uh, tree damaged by Semba deer in the mountains. So this is the, uh, this helps that the Forest Bureau to have a better understanding of the uh, population status and their uh, possible expansion or their damage to the vegetations. And young generations, uh, they are they also participating in the monitoring of the wildlife uh, using uh, uh, camera trappers. And uh, so they, the, there are more and more young generations hunters, they participate in this monitoring, which will further uh, uh, strengthen the management of the uh, game species, their, their populations. And with their helps that actually that uh, they, uh, we, can, we can have the monitoring uh, uh, into the uh, very difficult parent areas that so uh, which is good and uh, so that we 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 can have the monitoring device in the uh, almost no people activity areas uh, so that will bring bring back that uh, uh, even more information about the wildlife populations and they also report uh, and so that we can have a better uh, understanding, uh, we can have uh, even hunting areas and the non-hunting areas uh, for for comparisons. And uh, uh, scientifically, or the uh, scientifically, that this is uh, uh, this can provide uh, some management data. And so uh, this is an uh, ongoing process. And the more and more tribes, uh, communities, and the, their young generations participate and join this. So. Uh, in the futures that, uh, uh, so this is what's uh, uh, the present uh, Wildlife Conservation Act doing is that uh, they man the Wildlife Conservation Act managed the whole, uh, the, 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 uh, the wildlife population in the whole Taiwan. Uh, uh, but in the futures that we are expecting that with this uh, hunting management local, a community involved hunting management that uh, in the future that we hope that uh, the each communities can have uh, their own uh, hunting management areas. And so uh, for the Taiwan that this would means that uh, the wildlife management can uh, uh, divide it into several hundred or even thousand uh, small unit management unit and we believe that this will improve the wildlife management uh, in Taiwan. And so areas can maybe uh, will become the first indigenous hunting uh, uh, autonomous uh, area in Taiwan. And uh, I showed in the map that the uh, orange colors, that's the Zhou areas. Uh, whole. So maybe uh, later this year that the Zhou were, uh, Zhou uh, Hunters Association will sign uh, formally an agreement. It's not a treaty, uh, but it's an, an agreement with the government uh, to have this uh, total uh, management uh, power uh, on these areas. So this is the present uh, development of the uh, indigenous hunting uh, in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Um, we'll take questions at the end of the session. So we'll move right along to Benjamin, Benjamin Murray from the Office of the Registrar of Indigenous Corporations in Australia. And Benjamin's gonna talk about accounting for native title benefits as part of his work as a, as a postgraduate student in, in, his, in the Office of the Registrar. So I'll put, put it over to you, Ben, now. Wonderful, wonderful. Look, thank you, Guy. Um, and uh, um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to you, wherever you happen to be sort of watching today's forum from. Um, I'm quite delighted to have been asked to present today, and I'd like to thank the organisers um, for convening uh, 
convening the event. Um, before I begin, I just want to uh, acknowledge that I'm um, presenting to you today from the ancestral lands of the Ngunnawal people uh, in Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I'd like to extend that respect to all other Indigenous peoples um, that might be um, participating today. Um, when I started to put together my presentation, it's, it's kind of different in that um, I'm really hoping to discuss the corporate governance arrangements that exist around um, the commercial use of uh, ancestral lands and the rights and interests that accrue to Indigenous people from their ancestral lands. Um, I don't know if I have control. Can I go to the next slide if someone's doing that for me? Ah, so just some preliminary comments. So I um, I'm going to talk about uh, a particular act in Australia, it's a Commonwealth Act, uh, the Corporations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act. Um, it's, I'll refer to it throughout the presentation as the CATSI Act. Um, the CATSI Act is a special measure for the purposes of, uh, of our Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, and what that does is that because the Act itself allows Indigenous people to uh, come together and register corporations that will allow them to carry on uh, particular types of activities that they might like. Uh, and the, um, it, would otherwise, uh, it would otherwise fall foul of the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, it's a special measure under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So it does that. Um, the CATSI Act is uh, 2006. There was a predecessor act that um, uh, that was in place from 1976. The CATSI Act replaced it, uh, and the idea was that it would become a much more modern corporate statute. The CATSI Act itself uh, is modelled on our Corporations Act and takes key provisions out of that act uh, and puts them into the CATSI Act, while at the same time providing um, uh, some special uh, regulatory functions and powers for the registrar to meet the special regulatory needs of Indigenous people. Um, the report uh, that really gave rise to the CATSI Act talked about the special needs of Indigenous people as their socioeconomic circumstances, uh, their cultural values and practices that might at times be in conflict with Western understandings of corporate governance. The involuntary nature of, uh, of Indigenous corporations, and that will become apparent when I talk a little bit more uh, about native title corporations um, in a moment. Uh, many Indigenous corporations have social, economic and political ob uh, objects, objectives, and they are embedded in communities providing a range of of um, municipal and welfare services uh, to many Indigenous communities. Um, and a, a point that, that I'll make here uh, as well that will be relevant for the rest of the, the presentation is that um, Indigenous people in Australia have one of, if not the poorest levels of financial literacy uh, in the country. Um, and the relevance for that should become sort of obvious as we move through. Um, the other piece of legislation that's, that I'll be dealing with today is the Native Title Act. Um, I don't need to go into too much detail, but I can just sketch a wee bit out for you. Um, Native Title is the recognition by Australian law of Indigenous people's traditional rights and interest in land that are held under traditional law and custom. Um, so uh, where do I need to go now? Yes, um, and so this map uh, tells us, oh, sorry, yes, so the map just, I'm not sure how clear it is, but it sets out those areas where under native title, there's been exclusive possession native title uh, and non-exclusive possession native title. Um, there's really uh, not much need for me to go into the distinction about that. The important thing um, for my presentation is that 
um, when native title is recognised, it both creates um, and recognises the rights and interests that Indigenous people have to practise their culture on their traditional lands, but it also provides a mechanism uh, for them to able to leverage commercial benefits out of their traditional lands as well. Um, and so the way that that's done uh, is by Indigenous land use agreements um, that holders of native title are able to enter into um, with other parties. And they're really about the use and management of their traditional lands. Um, now, the relevance is that at the same time that the court will make a decision uh, that recognises native title, um, it will also make a decision about a corporation uh, that is to either hold the native title rights and interest in trust for the native title holders or to act as the agent of the um, native title holders. Um, in the, the determination um, holds that uh, that um, uh, that a corporation that's registered uh, for native title purposes must be a CATSI Act purpose uh, corporation. So that's the relevance to the previous comment around its involuntary uh, native title holders don't are not given a choice to dis. Um, to determine the type of corporation or the, um, or the type of legislation that they might use to, to pick their corporation or to, you know, their corporation to be registered under. Um, it, it's determined for it um, in regulations that prescribe, uh, that prescribe the body. Um, the next slide, please. Okay, um, so what I wanted to talk about before I go on here is just a little bit of the sort of corporate governance arrangements that I think are relevant to discuss today's discussion around this sort of difference between a traditional understanding of the use of ancestral lands and a commercial understanding of it. Um, so again, what we're interested in here in the office are the corporate governance arrangements because native title itself is a communal title uh, in land, um, that is, is sort of at, uh, at odds with with the um, with the understanding in Western society of an individual um, sort of owning title in land, and so the corporations themselves have to have governance arrangements in place that are able to be sensitive to the communal um, the communal aspect of the ownership of title. Um, very quickly, I just sort of set out, so CATSIAC corporations will have and must have a rule book, uh, it's a, a constitution that sets out the rules um, between the members and the corporation, uh, members and other members and, and directors uh, and members. Um, and the, 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 um, the, the rule book itself uh, can at times set out um, the arrangements for consultation and consent between the corporation itself, which acts uh, as either the agent or the trustee of the rights and interests, uh, and the common law holders or the traditional owners of native title um, that ultimately have to make the decisions about uh, matters that affect their native title rights and interests. So although it's the corporation that enters into any arrangements with third parties about uh, matters that affect native title rights and interests, they can only do that uh, if they've consulted and obtained the consent uh, of the native title holders themselves. Um, there's, a prescribed, uh, there's a prescribed requirement around documentation um, that consultation and consent has been carried out uh, and it's becoming an increasingly important uh, feature of the governance uh, framework and it's, um, it's uh, a feature that we as the regulator receive um, 
a number of complaints uh, about. So um, the next thing I just wanted to sort of point out because I'm talking about accounting is that this, um, like all uh, corporate uh, statutes, um, cor our corporations, CATSIAP corporations, are um, accounting entities. I think we've gone one slide too, too far. Uh, they're accounting entities and they are required uh, to maintain books and records uh, of their financial transactions and events that would enable uh, financial statements to be prepared uh, and audited. Um, so that's an obligation on all corporations. Some corporations, however, are, are reporting corporations or reporting entities. And um, under the Act, uh, there, there, there are uh, revenue thresholds for each year that require corporations uh, to prepare a financial report for a financial year and to lodge that financial report with the registrar. Um, there's a statutory requirement that all the directors of the corporation must take reasonable steps to comply with or ensure or secure compliance with the corporation's statutory reporting obligations. Um, if I could go to the next slide. Um, quite simply, um, a financial report for a financial year uh, contains the financial statements for the financial year, the notes to the financial statements, and the director's declaration about the statements and the notes. Importantly, um, our financial statements have to be prepared uh, in accordance with the accounting standards um, that are capable of applying to the corporation. So. Um, our threshold for financial reporting, the obligations for Indigenous corporations to report, is set at a quite low level um, by sort of recognised standards at uh, $100,000 of revenue in a financial year. Um, and so the financial, you know, the, the, the statutory requirements around the financial report um, require corporations to prepare financial statements that are um, similar in content and structure and disclosure to those that are prepared by um, publicly listed companies. Um, and so, you know, there's a real question about the accessibility um, and the resources that corporations have to be able to assist them to meet their statutory requirements. Um, the next slide. Please. Um, yeah, so the objective of financial reporting is to provide financial information about the corporation useful, um, and this is uh, to existing and potential investors, lenders and creditors to make decisions about uh, relating to providing resources. Um, and uh, importantly, the, the conceptual framework around reporting says that the users of financial reports uh, should have a reasonable knowledge of the accounting standards and business and economic activities and review and analyse the information diligently. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Indigenous people have one of the poorest levels of financial literacy in the country. So, the, so it's quite possible, quite arguable, that the preparation of financial reports and their use by members and common law holders of native title is going to be extremely problematic. And therefore, people's ability to make good decisions about what's the best commercial use of their traditional lands um, is, is severely affected, I think. Uh, the next slide, please. So the, really the importance or the point that I want to make here is that accounting itself and, and financial reporting um, is a very important mechanism in being able to use uh, and obtain benefits from traditional lands. Um, negotiations around financial reports, uh, sorry, negotiations around um, the use of traditional lands will always be framed uh, within a sort of Western concept uh, of business 
and it will use accounting as the language in which those negotiations and discussions take place. And if you have one party to those negotiations and discussions that are at a disadvantage because the language is unfamiliar to them, as accounting would be, uh, and uh, alternatively, if the the language itself, you're, you're not able to express um, what's valuable to you and what's important to you out of the arrangements, it, it puts you in in a in a in a um, a position uh, of, of subordination, really, in relation to that sort of dominant party. So in a lot of the discussions with large mining companies and others about the use of traditional lands, um, you know, the, the traditional owners uh, are really at a disadvantage uh, about, um, about being able to be understood and understand the language in which those discussions are taking place. Um, this is just another point. The other thing is that that's at the front end when discussions and negotiations are happening about the use of, of sort of traditional lands. But at the back end, after um, benefits, native title, native title benefits have been provided uh, uh, in return for the use of the traditional land, that information then has to be reported to uh, the to the holders uh, of native title. Um, and again, they uh, it has to be reported by the corporation and the directors, and it has to be reported to the, to, the, to the native title holders. So the problem that we have here is that the accounting standards are increasingly complex, they're harder to understand. Um, you know, a deep understanding of the, of, of the accounting standards, the framework mm -hmm. for this accountability mechanism um, only exists in a very small, select highly skilled group of technical experts given that you know many of many indigenous corporations native title corporations operate in remote areas of the country their access to this expertise um, is is limited and also it makes them highly dependent upon advisors uh, that they can trust in being able to assist them for the negotiations and then for the accounting for the native title benefits. Um, even many practitioners, many users of accounting standards, including sort of, you know, uh, accountants themselves, have only a working understanding of the standards. And again, my, my earlier point, Indigenous people have one of the poorest levels of financial literacy in, in, in the country. Um, so if we can pop to the next slide, please. Um, so these, are, I think, are some of the accountability issues um, that really show the tension between traditional values, traditional law and custom, and uh, Western notions of the commercialisation and exploitation of lands. So at the moment, there's a significant body of research. Indigenous people have needs that are not being met by the existing reporting framework. Uh, there are these contrasting worldviews uh, about um, well, just contrasting worldviews that make this sort of standardisation of financial reporting problematic and also make it difficult to incorporate uh, Indigenous values into a financial reporting framework. Um, there are different uh, sort of notions or contrasting approaches uh, to accountability in a sense. You know, Western system and, this, and the accounting system is really based on the idea of the accumulation and generation of economic capital and economic wealth, whereas Indigenous people have much more of a focus on the generation and accumulation of social capital and the social relationships uh, that are important to them. And so, you know, those things don't sit well together. Um, also, complex business structures. Um, the native title corporations themselves uh, understandably use um, some highly complex business structures in able to, to, you know, the same way that other people do, to protect particular assets uh, and keep them safe and quarantine them from others. Um, but the more complex the business structures, they create complex accounting, uh, and then it makes it um, makes it difficult for 
but common law holders as a group to be able to make sense of the native title benefits that are theirs um, when they're reporting. There's little research on the information needs of Indigenous users of financial reports. Uh, there's only a very small pool, <coughs> pardon me, of Indigenous accountants. Um, in around, I think, 2014, there was a wee bit of research that said that there were probably 15 Indigenous accountants recognised by any of the, um, the uh, accounting standards bodies in Australia. Uh, and um, that's increased now. So even though, even with the drive, there's only a probably, and it's unclear, there may only be more, uh, slightly more than 100. So the pool of Indigenous accountants um, to be able to help Indigenous organisations deal with these sort of complex business matters is extremely, extremely small. The other thing is that because the statutory financial reporting space is so crowded and has such onerous requirements, it really leaves little space for tailored financial reporting. So it leaves little space for directors and management to be able to tailor the reports uh, on native title benefits to meet the needs of users, uh, those common law holders, so they can understand uh, and make decisions, commercial decisions about the use of their traditional lands. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are these are some of the points um, that I made earlier, really, that negotiations around the use of traditional lands can be primarily framed in the language of accounting um, and and really sort of a language that um, uh, that that incorporates economic exploitation into it. And so this can sort of one, it's inconsistent with traditional values. Um, uh, but also it disempowers parties with limited limited li literacy. It also favours those parties whose position is best supported by accounting language. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, it, that sort of means that, that when um, Indigenous people are trying to promote uh, other values or extract other benefits or concessions from proponents, then um, their position is weakened because it's not supported by the, the language in which the negotiations are taking place. Uh, and it also just, the same thing, it makes their interests uh, of sort of the non-financially literate party, it makes them either invisible or less visible in the negotiations and places them at a disadvantage. Next slide, please. Um, I think I can leave this slide and move on to the next one because of that uh, we've discussed native title corporations. What's important about that is just that, that the corporation is responsible for holding sort of the benefits that are derived from native title. Um, so one of the one of the um, uh, features, one of the features, particularly in public policy in Australia, I'm not sure how it is in other countries, but, a, but there's a, a, a feature around uh, the need for the capacity development um, of Indigenous people. So acknowledging poor levels of financial literacy, socioeconomic disadvantage, and really the lack of participation at times in um, the market economy uh, means that Indigenous people struggle uh, to be able to participate fully and effectively in, in economic life. Uh, and this was recognised in the CATSI Act itself um, with the, the, the very um, original recommendation that any sort of legislation um, that caters for this must contain simple provisions uh, for the control of situation if things go wrong within an organisation to corruption, inefficiency, influences or for other reasons. Um, so what the CATSI Act has is that it has a provision that allows the registrar to examine the books of corporations and report uh, on the results of that examination. Uh, there are no grounds necessary to sort of trigger the registrar's interest and there is no review of the decision. It's, it's, um, 
it's not a reviewable decision. Uh, one of the other special uh, measures of regulatory assistance we have uh, is special administration. Um, and special administration uh, is a provision that allows the registrar, uh, if he or she is satisfied that certain uh, criteria have been met or satisfied, to appoint an administrator that effectively takes over the running of the corporation. Um, uh, there again, um, oops, answer that. Uh, if that happens, then the directors of the corporation uh, are removed from office uh, and essentially no business of the corporation can be transacted um, without uh, the approval of the special administrator. Um, the special administration is a function that the registrar uses um, uh, on you know, perhaps a dozen or more times a year for corporations. It's particularly diff it's different to external administration under corporation statutes. In that, whereas under other types of external administration, the point is to um, the point is to realise the assets of the corporation, satisfy outstanding liabilities, and wind the corporation up. With special administration, the idea is that the special administrator uh, corrects whatever problems led to the special administrator. Uh, being appointed and then um, hands the corporation back to members. So it acknowledges that at times um, circumstances will require the special administrator to be appointed to, to rehabilitate their corporations. Um, next slide, please. This last bit. Uh, so this is just a sort of an example where all of of what we've been discussing um, comes together. Um, we, we, the registrar's sort of appointed a special administrator to a native corporation recently. Once the special administrator had been appointed, um, the common law holders uh, complained of the lack of transparency and accountability in relation to native title benefits. Um, what had happened was that the agreement under which the benefits uh, were provided, um, provided for the payment of royalties to a trust, uh, and the trustee was unrelated to the corporation. So the relevant requirements, uh, both in the Act and, and in the accounting standards, to report hadn't been triggered because um, of, the, of, the, of the nature of the arrangement. Um, so the special administrator, um, was was empowered by the common law holders uh, to seek access of information about the trust. Um, now, the interesting thing is the trustee in this case sort of uh, fought back uh, and the matter's now sort of proceeded to the courts to see whether uh, the registrar can have jurisdiction um, over a sort of um, native title benefits that are really quite beyond uh, the reach um, of the corporation itself. Uh, and, and this would be really in assisting uh, the common law holders uh, to access information uh, about native title benefits uh, that are rightly theirs. Um, and I think I can end there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thanks very much, Ben. I've got to get used to using this uh, this microphone. That's very interesting. Um, the 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 differing worldviews, as we've talked about in some of the other presentations and, and other sessions, uh, filtering down into the language of accounting. So uh, the next, uh, we'll save our questions for the end for Ben. The next presenter will be. Uh, Sabiha Yasmin Rosi from the University of Dhaka, the Department of Women and Gender Studies. And Sabiha is going to talk about the commercialization of resources in the Chittagong Hill Tracks of Bangladesh. And I leave the floor to you, Sabiha. Uh, thank you so much, Bert. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to be a part of this uh, webinar series. 
So today I'll be uh, talking about uh, exploring the commercialization of resources in the Chittagong Hill Tracts of Bangladesh. It's actually a part of my PhD research that I uh, did in 2020. I finished uh, in 2020. And this is a very small part of my findings. Um, well, I did my PhD in Macquarie University, Australia. Um, so I think I will just start with a quote uh, from a development worker who was working there. That is, forest trees, lands, rocks, soils are main resources in Mandavan, including culture. Due to these things being grabbed, conflict between military and indigenous peoples will prevail. So this small quote, it actually gives a brief idea of what's going on in that region. Uh, before I go to the main discussion, I'm, I need to set a little bit of background because I'm sure many people are not aware of what's going on there. Uh, I will do that, but the motivation is to uh, kind of, you know, understand what is going on in the geographical tracks and why tourism is a concern there, and also why resources matter. So, why CHT? That is the short form. CHT uh, is a region that is a mountainous region in Bangladesh, and it is consisted of three districts: that is Ramamati, Kagarachuri, and Bandarban. In Bandarban, in, in 11 indigenous communities uh, live there. So this part actually has a history of deprivation because in Bangladesh, the dominant ethnic community is Bengali people. And in this zone and also some parts of the plain land of Bangladesh, some indigenous people, not some actually, many indigenous people sleep. So in back in 1980s actually uh, the government the state they settled uh, almost 400,000 Bengali people who were landless and destitute these people to this region because this region was the least crowded so when this settlement happened they also deployed military people to back up this settlement at that time, the conflict started between the Bengali people, the settler, and also the indigenous communities because the Bengali people, they started grabbing the lands of indigenous people. So that is the, uh, I mean, that that time, the armed conflict started between these two groups and also the military people, they supported Bengali people and that's why they started committing violence against indigenous people. In 1997, through a peace accord, they actually tried to minimize this uh, dispute, but actually the peace accord it is still, I mean, it hasn't been implemented properly. And the indigenous people, they have lots of demands which are yet to be fulfilled. The problem is that these people are not recognized as, as indigenous because, I mean, some, uh, the Bangladesh people, they think that if the term is uh, recognized as people as indigenous, then the people living in plain land, the Bengali people, their, uh, you know, the, the determination of their identity as indigenous might be hampered. But the thing is that we are following the definition of, uh, or the international standard that's set by United Nations, and following that, we want to say that, yes, indigenous people have been living in that region for from the very long time, and they were the first in that region. And also, when this settlement happened, these people's culture and their ethnic identity and also their land has always been, I mean, these, these things have been under attack and also threat. So. The, the conflict, whatever started, these indigenous people, they, they just want to be known as indigenous. They, and also they want their identity to be reflected in everywhere, in every sphere of this country. However, uh, 
Bangladeshi government and um, lots of other people, they don't regard them as indigenous. So I would probably not talk a lot about this debate because it has to be a separate section if I just want to uh, talk about this. Um, so why- Sabiha, so excuse me, Sabiha, could you try turning your camera on? Oh, okay. Thank you. Can you see me? So why tourism concern? Tourism concern is because of the, uh, first of all, the expansion of capitalist ideas of development through mass tourism. Whatever is going on in that region, that is following the mass tourism. And it is mostly through the, uh, sorry, it is mostly through the development of um, hotels, the, uh, you know, resorts or the eco park, these sort of things. And mostly this is happening to pro generate profit and the profits are generated by the, again, the dominant Bengali people who are investing to uh, develop these things. And the indigenous people, they are not really a part of this whole venture. They don't really get the benefit. So through this expansion of uh, these development projects uh, in that region, the the investors, the Bengali people, or even the military and the state, they have increased their control and power over these people, their ways of living and socio-political networks and the indigenous people's access to resources. So this actually creates an even cost and benefits of tourism because the costs uh, that, have, that have to be paid by the indigenous people and mostly the benefits are going to the Bengali people. So just uh, talking a little bit of the conceptual thing is that um, if I talk about accumulation by dispossession to understand what is going on and how the uneven development of tourism is uh, developing in that region, first of all, accumulation by dispossession is a, it's a capitalist economic uh, benefit related idea. And Harvick defines accumulation by dispossession as a concept that operates through the capture of surplus value by temporal displacement through long term investments and spatial displacements through opening up new markets, new production capacities, and new resources, social and labor possibilities elsewhere. So, through these, actually, the consumer rights of the people, indigenous people, uh, this is denied, and their lands are grabbed for factories, dams infrastructure and tourism to accumulate profits. And through this, actually, the government, they are also trying to promote this economic growth-based development in that region where uh, the indigenous people are not the primary actors. There are many actors working in that zone. And in most cases, this is, a, this is uh, an ongoing process of imperialism if we think that how these people's, uh, I mean, following the, the history of colonialism, we can also say that this is how, through the tourism development, these people's culture, their own identity, their resources are being taken away from them. And through this, the expansion of economy, the commercialization, the state is also not only having control over these uh, resources or land, but also over the indigenous people themselves so so that these people can really you know talk about their own self-determination or autonomy and <clears throat> through this process the natural resources are converted into products the the resources are generally if we talk about indigenous peoples and they don't really term these resources as um, products rather these resources are very much uh, you know, a part of their daily living, their daily life, because they have to rely on land, they have to rely on forest, water source or everything for their um, livelihood and, and the, their survival. So these are part of their life, these are part of their culture and custom, and they do have a sense of belonging to each uh, things that we are uh, actually charming as products. Uh, to generate profits. 
To do so, state implies political power and legal force for capital accumulation. And the making of places, of course, through tourism, these places are made into a um, destination with all the modern facilities so that the people outside of this region, they can come here and they can experience the beauty of this place and also have all the facilities of modern you know, hotels or resorts so that uh, they come there, they just go back there again and again. So this actually creates an unequal social relations between the various sectors, as I have said, that not indigenous people are actively involved in the profit making, in this profit making business. They are, of course, they are involved, but in a very small way, in a sense that they, the women who make the, uh, you know, the ethnic crafts, they just sell it. And and some of the people, not some, just a very few people, they work in hotels as a waiter or probably receptionist. But the owners of the resource, the owners of the hotels or everything, they are the Bengali people, not these indigenous people. So if I talk about the study site, so you can see the map of Bangladesh and the red square thing is the uh, Bandarban district where I worked. And this is a small map of the places I, I visited and I interviewed people, I worked with them. Um, so if I talk about the methods, it was an ethnographic research. So I was staying with the people. I was staying in um, with indigenous people as a, with the family as a paying guest. And I did participate in their social activities and some uh, cultural festivals and their religious rituals. I also attended wedding and other invitations. Um, mainly, I have interviewed uh, indigenous community people, men, women, hotel, uh, homestay owners, hotel staff guides, tour operators, uh, some tourists and auto rickshaw drivers. And also, I have interviewed um, development workers, human rights workers, police officers, journalists, and civil people as key informants. Um, so basically, the study places are Srila Prabhat, Parukara, Mekla, Bogale, Dilgiri, Nila, Chojin, Book. So anyone who is, uh, you know, if you ever plan to come to Bangladesh, I'm sure that uh, people might just recommend these places to you. But it's um, for the foreigners, it's not easy to go there. You have to take uh, permission beforehand and then you can visit that place. Anyway, so, and also there was, I followed the uh, ethical guidelines that was um, approved by Macquarie University uh, Research Ethics Committee. And um, I did maintain the confidentiality because that was a, a sensitive part of, uh, because I, I had to be very careful to not put my, um, you know, participants into danger because there was already, it is a post-conflict zone and still the military people, they stay there and there are camps, they have full control over the people, they have full control over the mobility, so I had to be very careful about this. Anyways, this is the place that I mentioned, Shirley Prabhat, that is one place. Um, people go there to visit and some women, they sell their ethnic crafts here. So just behind that Shirley Prabhat, there is uh, a village that we call Para, that is called Parupara. And you can see that um, this is the, the view of the Para. Uh, and mm, generally the tourists are not allowed to go there. Um, and uh, I did, of course, because I was uh, visiting the place and some of the people living in that para, they invited me. So that's how I developed a relationship with them and I interviewed the people uh, in that para and I even stayed there. So Megla is another place where that is also a perfect example of mass tourism. So see, you can see that uh, they have uh, made that hanging bridge and also some, they, there is a Jew and other things. So people go there, they spend three, four hours and then they leave. So 
uh, some women they have shops there and they sell um, some snacks uh, to their customers. That is also a way of earning livelihood for few people. And there is one quote. Probably I should talk about this later, but I will just uh, just uh, say it now. Is that um, young man who was living just beside this Mekla, uh, that that uh, para is called Tantranga Para. So it is. He said that in 1986 or 87, local people were called and told that they would make a tourism complex, and we had to give up our land. Now they are expanding the place and we're not happy about that. So far, 20 acres of land has been grabbed to build make a complex. To do so, the area has been built in a new manner with the road we used to um, use now closed. We do not feel free to move about and sometimes there are risks. Children suffered when they traveled to school due to road changes. We're happy, but our children are at risk of being harassed and abused by the tourists. We have a shop here and it helps us to provide for the family, yet we do not want to give up more land. So this is a quote that actually shows that how land is being grabbed from these people and they're not happy about this. So I will come back to this later. There is another place that is, uh, is close to Megla, just a few kilometers away, that is called Nilachil. So when I uh, went to this place in 2008, this place actually had nothing, just one small, you can see that the two-story small building that is like a complex. So that was the only thing there. But, but when I went there in 2017, I saw a huge change in that place. So you can see that uh, these new resorts are going uh, they are building this new resource and also there are restaurants, seating arrangements, and they are expanding the land. So when they're expanding the land, of course, they have to grab the land from the indigenous people. These people who relied on zoom cultivation that we call is, is uh, also can be called as shifting cultivation. So these people, they have to give up their land for this process and this is developed by the state. So as they follow the customary land uh, uh, rules, so they don't have proper formal deeds um, of ownership of this land. So that's why in most cases, the government can easily take the land and these people, they have nothing to do about this. They, they just have to move to um, you know, different livelihoods to maintain their life or um, they just have to move out from this place. So this is another example that is Nilgiri and uh, this is a military controlled tourism destination. You could say here, um, I mean, but the, mostly the VIP one, you, you, generally the uh, common people, they can't really stay here very easily. You have to take permission and all. But in most cases, what happens is that people go there, they stay there for two or three hours, and then they just leave. So it's a place of uh, like a day-long visit place, and um, you have to pay a ticket price, and there is also parking spots. You have to pay for that as well. So these are the basic things that is going on in Chiragong Hill Tracks. So this Nilgir thing, I mean, it is very close to rural indigenous people's uh, para. And these people who used to do Zoom cultivation, they had to stop it. And also the indigenous people, they're restricted to come nearby this uh, tourism, tourist place because um, they think that uh, in most cases, they think that if they do zoom cultivation, they have to burn the hills and that will destroy the beauty of the hill and the tourists might not feel interested to go there. So um, also the people are not happy about this because it's their land, it's their place, but they have restricted mobility and they can not do the cultivation as well. They have to change their livelihood. So this is um, 
not really uh, the indigenous people they are not really supporting this this is another place that is called Boga Lake and it is hosting homestay tourism and well when I went there back in 2017 we have we had to trek to reach this place but now they have made a road that just crossed through this Mara and uh, this is really shocking in a way that through this people might just go there in a very convenient way and that will be a risk for the environment and also the people. So why I have actually tried to talk about all this is that basically the economy we see there is, is developing in most cases is following the capitalist uh, way of development. And the natural resource are land, forest, water, sand, and stone. So um, land is at the biggest risk due to land grabbing in that area because they are actually developing all the um, you know, modern facilities and the hotels. And in most cases, these are happened uh, through the military or through the state or through the powerful political people. So these people, they uh, develop this thing, and in, in most cases, they don't really include the people. They don't really talk to the people or involve them in the development of tourism. In most cases, the tourists also, they visit the place and they um, don't really care about the environment. They throw the garbage anywhere and um, they're not very respectful towards indigenous people as well. So this is also a challenge for developing tourism in that region because people have to be aware of what should they do as tourists. And in most cases, an equal distribution of environmental cost and benefits that have implications on the indigenous people because their culture and their um, bond or their um, you know, relationship with the environment that is at risk. They have to uh, get displaced from their own land and they have to probably you know, move somewhere else. A lot of people, they have uh, been uh, a threat of, they have been going through the threats of um, displacement because of this. And there has been some news, uh, in, in, in newspapers and also um, lots of people they were protesting when in Kagaraturi they, they uh, wanted to make an eco it's the powerful actors to make the plan they implement everything and the indigenous people they are um, they do not have enough power to talk for themselves so this unequal distribution is um, putting these people in a risk of losing their own resource, their traditional land, and the place is turning into a commercial place where anyone can go, people can go, they can just disturb their peace and do whatever they want. There is not enough rules to how to act or behave in that certain environment. So the control and access over nature, it actually in signify local people where the priority is to um, show power for profit uh, generation. And through this uh, use of nature environment and also the infrastructural development, the commercialization and exploitation of nature is going on. The local people are marginalized and the environment is threatened. So there is one example of what is going on. Uh, you can see that the illegal stone extraction is going on. So this is very important because in uh, generally, if the stone is extracted, then the water sources will dry up. And um, it has been found that some village uh, I mean, they had the people of some villages, they had to move from, from their own place because the water sources dried up. And when this thing is happening, it is mostly illegally happening. 
they take permission from the uh, government office, but uh, probably, you know, it, it is not a very clear process or um, the permission is given to extract probably a little amount of uh, stone, but they do it in a large scale. So they don't really bother about uh, the rules or regulations. The problem is that the people who live nearby this place, they have to either get displaced or their livelihood that needs to be changed. This is an example of how tourists actually behave. So um, this is a waterfall. Um, the season I went there, it was almost dried up uh, and it, was, it is in a very remote place but you can see that people dropped the plastic bottles and not only the plastic bottles, but also the plastic uh, bags or the snacks, um, this sort of things. So this is also a risk for the environment. And if we now want to see how the indigenous people are situated in tourism is that they are not really present in the development planning. Um, when the development is going on, um, they are not asked what they want. There is no participation, no um, direct uh, involvement in the decision making. And sometimes the people, they say that uh, the, the people who are, um, you know, in what the policy maker or the planner, they say that, okay, uh, these people, they actually don't know what do they want. So we are at the better, better state to decide what do the need. And also they don't have enough control over their own land or environment because of all these things going on. They have limited participation in tourism or the economic benefits to get um, out of it. Uh, there is enough, I mean, they have to change their livelihood and also the indigenous culture that is shifting. That is also, um, is you know, people they have shifted a little bit and they are following the Bengali culture somehow because lots of people are going there and culture is a is not something that will be fixed so it is always changing so the thing is that if we should or shouldn't promote tourism probably uh, the indigenous people are not really against of tourism but the thing is that how we are developing this. And we can't say that people shouldn't travel or people shouldn't go to visit beautiful places or some, or, or you know, just enjoy the uh, laser thing. But of course, we should be careful about how the people of that specific place or the host communities are um, involved in this, or if they are actually welcoming us or not. And also, if we are respectful towards them, or if we are enough responsible towards them for the culture and nature. So these are the things that we probably should be aware of, and then probably you can think of promoting tourism in that case. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sabia. Uh, very interesting talk. And we will have questions for the panelists afterwards. Um, our next uh, presenter is Emma Garlett from my old employer, Curtin University. And Emma's going to talk about the right approach to water management, the need for traditional owner merits appeals and water and water licensing decisions in my own, uh, my former locality, Western Australia. So I leave it to you, Emmett. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I will just share my screen with you all. All right, so yeah, welcome all. Thank you, they were great. And thank you so much for inviting me to present. So I'm speaking to you all from Perth, Western Australia, as Guy mentioned, which is Wajak Nunga country. And our people have cared for this country and waterways for generations. Um, on my mum's, I'm an indigenous person. On my mum's side, I'm Nibali and a Yamaji person. And on my dad's side, I'm a Nunga person as well. And I would like to acknowledge uh, my elders, both past and present, and emerging leaders and any other Indigenous people present here today. And I would like to specifically recognise um, Dr Anne Polina, 
who is has joined us, who I hope this research that I'm presenting you can support and the Matawara Fitzroy River Council. And I'd also like to recognise Michael Williams, who's also in here, who um, has taken all the photos of the Matawara River from a trip uh, recently. And it's what you can see behind me here. So thank you. So this research is a part of my Law Honours research, which I conducted last year. And it falls within the intersection of water resources law and native title and administrative law. So what I've done is I've examined the impact of granting water licenses on native title interests and options for native title holders to protect their interests in water resources. So First Nations people used to be 100% of Australia. Now we're only about 3%. And if you look to where First Nations people, um, specifically traditional owners, have any leverage to try to even control decisions which impact them. It has occurred only relatively recently in native title um, in, and also uh, through, through a native title determination and the right to negotiate in the Native Title Act. So I want to talk about water with you all today, specifically water resources and the use of water through a water licence. So I'm going to speak to you about uh, my idea uh, an argument for a traditional owner merit appeal right to water licensing decisions in Western Australia. And to do this, I'll address the following points in my presentation. Firstly, the importance of water for First Nations people. Then secondly, water law, then native title rights to water, water law reform. And to conclude, I'll um, apply this to a case study or the situation with the Matawara Fitzroy River. Um, before I start, uh, just to clarify a couple of terms. So when I say a traditional owner, I mean someone who has a native title right and interest in water in a native title determination or a register or who or who are registered claimants. And a water license is a legal document containing terms, conditions, and limits. And the license does not give the holder ownership of the water resource. The water remains vested in the crown, but the license gives access to the water for a specified duration. And a water right is a legal authority to take and benefit from the use of water. So um, let me begin. I'd like to start by saying water is significant to Indigenous people in Australia. It carries great cultural, spiritual, environmental, economic and social significance. Water is sacred to Indigenous people. It's an elemental source and symbol of life. Aquatic resources are an integral component of the Indigenous customary economy. And KEP, the word you can see on the screen, is the word for fresh water in the Wajak Noongar language. And Indigenous language groups have their own words for water. Water is tied to culture and it's shown in art, as you can see some of these paintings on the screen. Um, and these paintings are actually paintings I've done myself to show my connection to water and that it's an intrinsic to my being and my identity and livelihood. And this is a case for many Indigenous people as well. Um, and Indigenous people were the first water managers prior to colonisation and they had water management regimes in Australia long before common law rights were induced with, uh, introduced with colonisation. And the Indigenous worldview of water is holistic, meaning Indigenous people see water as interconnected with land, not distinct from one another, um, as opposed to when you see with legal regimes, you often have land and water um, are seen separately under Western law. This is a really significant quote, which I um, had found throughout my research, and it shows uh, the significance of water to Aboriginal people. So Joe Brown is an elder and a traditional owner of the Great Sandy Desert, and he said that water is the basis for our songs and our culture. We've been looking after our water holes and rivers for thousands of years. We have respect because we know that if you don't treat it right, many things can happen. This is a lesson that we need to make other people learn. People see water as just a thing that can be drunk or used. They don't see it as a part of everything. They think they can own it. We know better and many things fail because people don't understand this. And this quote really encapsulates how Indigenous people see water 
that is holistic, interconnected, as opposed to a Western system that sees water separate from land and doesn't have a holistic perspective. Um, in addition to that, it is recognised internationally that Indigenous people hold valuable knowledge. Indigenous communities are the repositories of vast accumulations of knowledge and experience that links humanity with its ancient origins. Their disappearance are a loss for the larger society, which could learn a, a great deal from their traditional skills in sustainably managing very complex ecological systems. Um, in addition, the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous people is very clear, and it states that Indigenous people should have the power to decide on development proposed on their land and waters. And then if we look to more uh, uh, um, Australian policy, the National Water Commission stated in 2012 that Indigenous Australians have managed their land and water sustainably for thousands of generations through their spiritual, customary and cultural connection to the landscape. So there's international evidence that Indigenous people have connection to land. There's domestic evidence and there's also uh, local evidence as well to, sh to show and prove that Indigenous people have connection to their water. Now, this slide I'll talk about the water law in Western Australia and the current situation here. So really the common law water rights in Western Australia shape um, the regulation of water and the rules of common law remain the foundation of Australian water law. So common law water rights existed in the early years of the colonies, relied upon it being in possession of land and Aboriginal people were not recognised as being in possession of land. Due to this, Aboriginal people were excluded from common law water regimes. And as a result, the subsequent regulatory mechanisms were designed to facilitate irrigation and agriculture and not Indigenous uses. So from that, we can say that Indigenous people's rights to water have mostly been admitted from Australia's complex water planning and management regimes. So water law in Western Australia, as I mentioned earlier, it is based on a Eurocentric worldview of the, from the colonisation of Australia and Indigenous water rights compete with other water rights in the legal system. Um, the right to take and use water may be conferred on landholders and um, many Indigenous people have expressed concerns that an ongoing process of colonisation has deprived Indigenous people um, for the enjoyment of their traditional rights to water. In Western Australia, the principal act governing the taking and using use of water is the Rights in Water and Irrigation Act. And this act outlines how water users may take water from surface and groundwater resources. In Western Australia, the right to the use and flow of water best in the Crown. And similar legislation has been enacted in all other states in Australia. If we look at water resources in WA, it's some of the oldest and it developed, was developed at a time when water demand was low and water was more abundant. Um, it's current water licensing is currently a one size fits all approach as the current laws were not designed with the state's current needs and challenges in mind. The Water Act uh, has been amended many times and it's, off, and it's very convoluted as well. And the state government is undergoing water law reform. But currently there are no third party appeal rights um, for water licensing decisions under the RUI Act. And water resources are currently managed under six different acts of parliament, um, which is not really effective in my opinion. So a water license is property and a tradable right. It can be granted pursuant to section 5C of the RUI Act. Um, and with this point, I, I'll say that Indigenous people, they can hold water rights in the same manner as any other Australian by uh, getting the grant of a water license. This is often very, very expensive. But the issue is in addition to that, there is an ongoing social justice issue that the available water resources in certain parts of Australia have been largely or fully allocated without Indigenous people having the opportunity to obtain water licences or even significant land ownership that would enable them to exercise statutory rights of water um, by virtue of general land ownership. 
And the last point is Indigenous people do not have express water rights in the Wirriwiri Act. And so I say that there's inadequate provision for Indigenous people to participate in water management without this express recognition. This slide, um, I'll talk about native title rights to water. And so I've examined the impact of water licences on native title holders' interests in water. And I've also considered options for action by native title holders. And native title holders have no decision-making authority over water, nor do they have a right to negotiate with developers over water licence applications. And traditional owners are concerned that all the water in the region will be licensed for use by others before they have a chance to develop enterprises which might require water. Under the Native Title Act, traditional owners have a procedural right to comment on license applications, but this has no real input into the granting of these water licenses. The Native Title Act recognises that uh, native title interests and rights in water in section 223 However, these native title rights to water must be traced to traditional laws and customs regarding water to the date of sovereignty. And native title rights to water will also coexist with the state's water control regime. So the Native Title Act um, does not provide for a right to negotiate over water. Cert certain procedural rights exist under the Native Title Act regarding native title holders and claimants. And as I mentioned before, it's a right to be notified and a right to comment by action um, on action by government regarding water. So looking back at Western Australia and applying this, the scope of native title interests in water that have been recognised in Western Australia are minimal. And any native title determination regarding water commonly indicates there is limited commercial or economic rights and that a native title right in water is generally exercisable in accordance with and subject to traditional laws and customs for personal, domestic and non-commercial communal purposes. And so native title water rights are considered by many commentators as unlikely to encompass contemporary forms of commercial water development in artificial bodies of inland water. So effectively, when the state issues new water licences, these licences um, diminish native title rights to water. So the grant of the water licence takes away and prevents traditional owners from accessing and using their groundwater on their land. So there should be a form of compensation for native title holders in these circumstances. And a key issue with this is, uh, involves a groundwater table. When the water is taken, the groundwater table is lowered and this water table not, may not come up for decades, which means the native title right to water may be displaced for decades or hundreds of years. So my argument of having a traditional owner merit appeal right um, may provide a fair opportunity for a significant level of protection for traditional owners who could ensure water extraction is conducted in a sustainable way. Looking at um, water reform, um, the National Water Commission has released a position statement on Indigenous access to water resources, outlining the priorities for improved Indigenous access to water resources and planning. And some local governments have partnered with Indigenous communities to manage a water resource. Um, the Productivity Commission publicly released their National Water Reform um, 2020 Inquiry Report last year. And the report acknowledged the demands from Indigenous Australians, noting traditional owners aspire to a much greater access to and control over water resources. And the Commission also suggested a suite of policy reforms, recommendations and support for water justice for Indigenous people. So the water reform um, currently happening in Western Australia is a significant moment where the state has a significant opportunity to apply best practice decision making that fairly represents traditional owners needs where those traditional owners are impacted by licensing decisions. Uh, in addition, this is really what it comes down to is decision making and recognising that better environmental decisions are made if Indigenous knowledges and perspectives are included in the decision-making process. 
administrative law is the mechanism which will allow traditional owners to seek a merit appeal of water licensing uh, through the State Administrative Tribunal in Western Australia. And in addition, the Department of Water and Environmental Re Regulation, um, which is the body that uh, issues the water licences, they should owe a duty of uh, judicial review, procedural fairness to, cons to consult traditional owners in a manner beyond that provided by the Rights in Water Irrigation Act and regulations. This really should occur through distributive justice and procedural justice. Now, now I'll compare what other states in Western Australia, uh, in other states in Australia are currently doing, um, looking at New South Wales and Victoria, because the legislation is different. Um, in Western Australia, as I mentioned, before um, we don't have any merit appeal rights um, in WA only the applicant for the water license has the right to apply um, to the state administrative tribunal for the review of the decision to deny a water license um, or under the RUI Act to grant them on conditions that the application by uh, applicant finds unsatisfactory so the anal uh, analysis of the legislation shows that New South Wales has the broadest merit appeal rights for third parties pursuant to section 368 of the Water Management Act, which outlines the subject matter of the appeal of the appeal and the broad rights of appeal. In addition, New South Wales has a specialist land and environmental court. In Victoria, third party appeal rights are allowed by a person whose interests are affected by a decision pursuant to section 64 of the Water Act. And the case of Paul and Goldburn Murray, um, the court outlined the interpretation of interest in gaining standing. So this can show you that Western Australia is far behind and we do not include community or indigenous interests in our decision-making around water resources. So it's very important now while the state is undergoing water reform that we include Indigenous people. Moving on now, um, I'll talk a bit about the Matawara Fitzroy River. Um, so the Matawara Fitzroy River is in the Kimberley region in Western Australia. And the Kimberley region is in the far northwest corner of Australia, and it's home to an, a diverse abundance of landscapes and diverse ecosystems and species. The Matawara is one of the largest rivers in Australia um, and the Matawara catchment sp spans almost 94,000 square kilometres. It is one of the limited number of rivers in Australia which are in a relatively natural condition, not dammed, redirected or modified by development. The Matawara has a spiritual significance as the traditional owners who live along the Matawara believe that the Matawara is an ancestral being for all traditional owner groups who belong to the river and the river systems. So it is a very culturally significant river for traditional owners who use the river to maintain a connection to country and practice traditions and ceremonies. The Matawara is also a national heritage listed in Australia as a part of the West Kimberley National Heritage Place. And it's listed for its environment and cultural values. And it really, this, this river can be contextualised by reference to the historical perspective of Matawara country, um, which includes the early encounters with Aboriginal people, the impacts of colonisation and pastoralism. And all of these events have influenced the current policy and legislative development surrounding the management and governance of the Matawara. In my view, there is a lack of legal rights to ensure that Indigenous interests in water are protected through water resource planning and licensing decisions. There is really no voice for Indigenous Australians and no justice in the water regime in WA for Indigenous people. So this really needs to change. The important point is, what I'll say is, traditional owners who have a connection to land can receive uh, royalties or payments under the right to negotiate regime of the Native Title Act. However, traditional owners who have a connection to water and Native Title water rights recognised, they receive something. So there's a big gap there in, in that. Um, and in this way, Indigenous Australians are excluded from Australia's agricultural wealth, which comes from the access to water, the irrigation for crops. So Indigenous people need more. They need a voice. They need recognition in water. And there really needs to be inclusion of Indigenous people in the law. 
So the law reform required, um, I say that the proposed act needs to include traditional owners in decisions. If it doesn't, it will continue to exclude, divide and not value Indigenous interests. So the inclusion of traditional owners in water law will provide recognition of traditional owners' right to water under native title and value their cultural connection to waters in Western law. And this will assist in closing the gap and protecting Aboriginal cultural heritage. So we need to act now to ensure that water decisions are made to represent all stakeholders. So the WA water reform needs to include a statutory mechanism to allow uh, and ensure traditional owners are consulted in water resources planning. And this also will help provide self-determination for Indigenous people, and it will make things fairer towards traditional owners. So to conclude, Indigenous rights to water are limited by legislation. A traditional owner merit appeal right will provide a solution to protect the environment and allow traditional owners to appeal water licensing decisions which impact their access to and use of water. A third party appeal is a tool to appeal development, such as pro proposed development to irrigate the Matawara Fitzroy River, which is to farm cotton, which we can see from other states like in New South Wales, um, the detrimental effects that have happened on the Murray-Darling Basin when significant water resources have been taken to, to do the, such things. We don't want that really happening in the Kimberley, in the Matawara. And water is scarce. And it's a natural resource. Yes, it can be replenished, but we don't want to ruin a pristine waterway, one of the few we have left in the country um, for development. So we need to value Aboriginal people and we need to value what, value what Aboriginal people want now because it hasn't been valued in the past for a long time. So now's the time to act. Now's the time to show that what Aboriginal people want is important rather than deciding what is best for us. When that, and what happens is we need to be included in developing the law when it affects us and our decision-making. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, and does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah, why don't we start then uh, following up on Emma's uh, um, uh, Corey to have questions. What I think we'll do is uh, we'll open it up for questions. We have some comments in the Q&A and we also have some other questions. And then uh, we'll go, uh, we'll have, we'll, after the question period, about 10 minutes, we'll, we'll have some final comments by some of the organizing committee. I have a, a couple of questions here and I, I think I'll just run through the, the questions and then we'll just go through and the panelists can then answer them. Um, the first one question would be to uh, Curtis, and that uh, and the question in, in involves whether or not the rule book or the traditional law that uh, the so uh, hunters use includes the commercial selling of meat uh, and whether or not there's commercial activities in terms of the hunting activities. The second question would be to Ben, and I, and this was already partially answered in the in the Q and A, and that is, is the exclusive possession aspect of uh, of native title? Uh, what uh, are the uh, the advantages or disadvantages that you see from the perspective that you're discussing in terms of commercial realization? Um, the question for for Yasmin is that. Um, you, you mentioned in your presentation that indigenous people are not benefiting from the, the commercialization and the development of the, the, the hill track. And I'm wondering, I know in other circumstances, you've seen development occur where there's sort of like a faux traditional activities that go on where you, you go to the indigenous villages and you see how indigenous folks lived. I know, uh, um, and I'm wondering if if that sort of activity is is you mentioned handicrafts. Uh, is there this sort of stereotypical I'm going to go visit the hills and and see where the traditional people live and they'll have a special area set aside. And then 
the final question for Emma, um, you mentioned you're a Nuga person and there is a, there was a large settlement in Western Australia with the state regarding lands. And I'm wondering what were the provisions, if any, relating to water from the perspective that you've talked about today? So uh, I can repeat those questions too, but maybe we could start with Curtis. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that I didn't explain clearly that of what uh, the indigenous people can do and cannot do. Uh, at at present, actually, start from two, uh, 1973. Uh, no people in Taiwan can have uh, legal hunting, and uh, including commercial hunting, including uh, by law, by law, and including. Uh, sports hunting. Uh, however, uh, this uh, this requirement never uh, being uh, uh, enforced in the mountain areas, uh, in the indigenous territory. So actually, indigenous people continue hunt uh, uh, until today, for uh, for mostly for. Um, uh, personal consumptions or family consumptions. So uh, in in two thousand in in two thousand uh, the the Wildlife Conservation Act that uh, provide uh, the opportunity to specifically to indigenous people in Taiwan for ceremonial hunting. So hunt only for ceremonies purpose and uh, not for uh, uh, the family use is for ceremonial use only. And in after uh, 2017, the experimental uh, uh, management uh, project provide a new uh, additional uh, rights for hunting for daily use, the family use. So those communities involved in the experimental project, they can do family use hunting. Others, they can still, uh, they still can only do ceremonial hunting if they apply. And, and for those uh, communities that involve in the, uh, in the experimental project, for example, like uh, so they can do daily uh, family use hunting. So that's the difference. And in the futures, uh, in the futures that the commercial hunting will still be banned in Taiwan because uh, Taiwanese government and the public believe commercial hunting will eventually uh, make the wildlife population collapse. So commercial hunting will still not be allowed uh, uh, in Wildlife Conservation Act. And also uh, the spatial, uh, spatial agreement between Taiwanese government and the indigenous communities in the future will still restrict the usage of the hunting to be family use, not commercial use. So, uh, so the commercial hunting in Taiwan will still uh, be illegal for, for many years, I believe. So that's the presence uh, status. Thank you, Curtis. Um, uh, maybe Benjamin, you could uh, opine on your question. Yeah, look, I haven't given much thought to this question, but I, I must admit um, to what you, you're really asking, what are the economic consequences that can flow to common law holders from whether their native title uh, is recognised as exclusive possession or non-exclusive possession? Um, and so I've not, I've not really given it a great deal of thought. Um, 
and and I probably wouldn't know where to start actually. <laughs> That's fine. The, the I I guess the let me let me rephrase it. Does native title mm -hmm. as as you see it? Uh, you've mentioned some of the problems with the CATSI Act. Is is it? Uh, it's been sort of presented here in Australia as a mechanism of economic self uh, improvement, self determination. Uh, what are some of the issues other than the accounting issues you pointed out in your presentation that you think should be addressed if, in terms of economic uh, use of these lands? Um, I, look, there's there's a couple of issues. One is perhaps public policy. Uh, issues that really are struggling with whether native title benefits money are essentially private monies that flow to uh, affected common law holders because one of the things in a determination of, of native title, there might be a large determination area, but within that area, there'll be a number of estate groups. Um, and so depending on how the proposed development will affect and who it might affect, which are state groups, those benefits cannot flow, may not flow to all the common law holders. They may be restricted to just those common law holders that are affected. And so there's, there's a, a public policy sort of discussion, I think, around whether that money is public money for the benefit of uh, all common law holders, uh, and I might add that overlaid with that is also the idea that within the traditional lands, there'll be communities uh, that include Aboriginal people that are not common law holders, so there are people that have, that have moved onto other people's country uh, and live there, and there'll also be sort of um, yeah, non-Indigenous people living in communities as well. And, and this is the idea, you know, there's this sort of conflict between whether it's private money or whether it becomes public money that should be available for purposes um, to benefit uh, Aboriginal communities, Indigenous communities within the determination area um, itself. So this, that's one issue. There is, of course, another issue about how different, whether you might set up particular funds for example, um, a, a sort of an intergenerational or a future fund where certain uh, a particular amount of the native title benefit payment might be quarantined for future generations uh, as opposed to be available for immediate expenditure now. So there's a lot of sort of planning questions about how native title benefits should be used and distributed, and that goes to the populations that should be eligible uh, to whether it should be public or private purpose and whether the use should be sort of, you know, current uh, or future and, and what that appropriate balance of current and a future expenditure might be. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, uh, Sabiha, uh, the, did, you, did I make myself clear on the question? I think so. Um, so the thing is that tourism in Bangladesh is, is a very new thing. It has started uh, developing since, I would say, after 2000. So uh, generally, people were not really into tourism. Uh, but nowadays, people are they just love traveling. So in the last few years, there has been a lot of change in this sector. So what you are asking about the indigenous people's direct involvement, um, especially in home state tourism, right? Mm. I, I think it is that. Yep. So yeah, very few people are involved in home state tourism. That is in, that I uh, showed in, in Boba Lake. Uh, that's a little far away from the main city of to, of Bangaban. And generally, BOM indigenous community group, they are involved in homestay tourism. Not all the indigenous groups are involved. Generally, BOM people, BOM indigenous group people, they are involved in 
comes to tourism, they're involved in making ethnic crafts, and uh, also they sell their thing in the main mass tourist spot. It's not that people want to go there to uh, look at their lifestyle or the ethnic crowds. It's still they want to visit the place that is naturally beautiful. And as part of that process, they also buy the uh, traditional things of the indigenous people. And the people even who go to um, uh, you know stay uh, with the indigenous people, they also try to visit the nearby places, rather actually, you know, observing or experiencing the lives of indigenous people. So still now we haven't developed that perspective. It is uh, more like going and just spending some time with nature, having fun, this sort of thing yet. Okay. All right, well, thank you. And, and the, you know, the last word to you, Emma. I'll just unmute myself. Yeah, so um, your question was about the Nyunga, the settlement in particular, and water. So I wasn't involved in any of those negotiations. And um, But what I will say is that in regards to water under the Native Title Act, uh, traditional owners have a, tradi have a procedure right to comment on licence applications. But the Native Title Act doesn't provide for a right to negotiate over water. And there's only certain procedural rights that exist under the Native Title Act regarding Native Title holders or claimants. And these are rights to be notified and a right to comment on action of government regarding water under Section 24HA of the Native Title Act. Um, what I think should happen in these circumstances where there are settlements or negotiations um, of significant claim areas and water in the future because there, prob there may be well be a lot more native title claims and determinations coming through is that proponents or anyone um, that has historically been using or accessing water, um, they should help Aboriginal people and really go beyond the confines of the law because it's really not fit for purpose um, and the government needs to recognise that and and, 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 and something the government should recognise as well is native title is very restricted. It only recognises uses of water for Aboriginal people relative to traditional laws and traditional customs. It doesn't recognise really, well, in certain parts of Australia, there are some limited commercial use and access of water, but it is not across all uh, native title claimant groups or determination. So, Really what I think should happen is there should be more commercial development in water re with water resources with Aboriginal people. Um, and this will enable economic opportunities and allow Indigenous people to have more self-determination, allow them to take control of their life um, and allow them to be motivated to preserve and access their land and use it in a sustainable way where they can benefit rather than being exploited. So it's very important. Um, and it's very future focused, but um, I think it can happen. So thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we're a little bit over time and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, rightly so, given the interest of the, uh, the presentations. And I, I, I guess this is our last, uh, the last session of the uh, webinar series, Natural Resources, Culture and Law for this year. And so if there's, I, I would just like to open the floor if just for a few comments from any of the organizing committee, if they'd like to make a comment and we'll, we'll end there. And, uh, and again, I'd like to also thank the panelists for their time. This is a lot of time and a lot of commitment. Is there any one of the, the organizing committee that would like to speak? If not, we'll just close it at that. But uh, I open the floor to uh, any of the committee. Um, thank you, Guy. Um, I think it was a good uh, web, webinar, and I enjoyed uh, all the presentations from uh, session one. And, and and I hope that this will continue, and hopefully that I will see some of the results in paper too, uh, on printed. Yeah. So thank you, um, Mitsu Takahashi from Japan, and thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Mitsu. Uh, Steve, are you there?
we have we he have silent not able to come today um okay. but he wanted me to pass along the message on behalf of um ucla center for southeast asian studies just thank you to everyone for participating the moderators panelists um, and everybody who worked on the webinar and and i'll look i'll join i'll join maddie on that i, I want to thank everybody and for uh each and every session they were excellent uh thank you Maddie and, and Earl and, and everyone over there at UCLA for uh, doing the technical side of it as well and being excellent presenters. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. And I hope we can do this again next year. And thank you for the presenters. Thank you, Guy. Just a couple quick closing things. Um, I just want to say again, thank you to our panelists, our moderator for closing out the um, entire webinar series. Thank you for sharing all your expertise and knowledge. And also a big thank you as always to our attendees here on Zoom and also on Facebook at the Engaged Scholarship in the Asia Pacific page. I just want to quickly run through again all of our um, co-organizers. Um, so thank you to Professor Dawei Kwan from the Science and Technology Innovation Center for Taiwan, Philippines, Indigenous Knowledge, Local Knowledge, and Sustainable Studies, or CDPLs, from National Chengchi University, Taiwan. He was also unable to be here. I do want to say thank you to Professor Guy Charlton of the University of New England First Peoples um, Rights and Law Center in Australia and the Auckland University of Technology Center for Indigenous Rights and Law, and a special thank you for moderating this last panel. Also, a thank you to Professor Mitsu Takahashi of the University of Toyama from Toyama, Japan, as a partner for this year. And lastly, on behalf of Professor Stephen Akabato, who I mentioned is unable to be here tonight, I wanna to offer a thank you to the UCLA Department of Anthropology, UCLA Asia Pacific Center, and a special thank you to the UCLA Center for Southeast Asian Studies for hosting this webinar series. And lastly, I just wanna say thank you to our behind the scenes contributors, Noet Tong and Aaron Ye from the UCLA Center for Southeast Asian Studies, Alex Zhu from UCLA International Institute for his IT assistance, and Earl John Cito Hernandez from Partido State University in the Philippines for managing this webinar series with me. And last, last message, to catch up on this webinar series, you can check us out under the name Engage Research in the Asia Pacific on both YouTube and Facebook. And with that, I do want to say thank you. Have a great day. Have a great evening. Um, and thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, all.